So today I'm speaking to Martin Pemberton, who's a former professional footballer who played for various clubs, but most notably Oldham and Doncaster. How's it going? You okay? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Nice to meet you. I'm uh, looking forward to this. Uh, we'll we'll get dive straight in and we'll, we'll see what comes from it, yeah? <laughs> straight in at the deep end. <laughs> <laughs> now, well, thanks for coming on. Um, I mean, how's things at the moment? How's life? Kind of how are you and yourself? Brilliant, mate. I mean, yeah, it's great now. As we'll allude to when we, we get chatting, it, it wasn't always that way after after retiring. And there's been quite a lot of changes to where I find myself now, both professionally and personally. Um, but right now, yeah, I'm in, a, I'm in a good spot. There's still a few challenges on, on the way to come and, and different things personally. But overall, yeah, I mean, from where I was to where I am now, it's, it's a, like completely different. Oh, amazing. That's good to hear. And in terms of like what you're doing now, just let us know like what, what it entails. Yeah, so what we what I do now with my partner, we run a lot of group coaching and training programs and it's called uh, Mentally Match Fit. So it's, it's based around football, but it's to do really with like mental fitness. So obviously now in, in, there's a lot of mental health awareness, you know, it, it, it's kind of everywhere. But I think I feel like it's kind of stagnated because although there's more awareness, I'm not sure that things are, are changing, right? So the way we're trying to look at it now is, well, like physically, you know, when 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 we talk about physical health, the first yeah. thing that most mm -hmm. people think about is going to the gym, changing their diet, looking after themselves, essentially. But when we say mental health, it's not it's not on the solutions, it's on the problems. And so everybody's focus is like, depression, suicide, anxiety. So in my mind, I'm like, for a start, that's the first thing that maybe we need to start to address to think of what our kind of subconscious thoughts are when it comes to mental health, because it's it seems to be focusing on the problem. And, and if you do that, you don't find solutions. And then with the physical side of things, and I think about when, you know, being a footballer, you're either physically, you've got an illness, you got an injury or you're unfit. You know, people are in those three categories in terms of where they are physically. Yeah. But I yeah. think now, and I've said, it's not any different mentally. We've got people who are ill. We've got people who were injured, which I certainly was. And then we've got people who are, when I say unfit, I don't mean it like in a really derogatory way, but they might lack yeah. the cognitive skills or not practiced enough to be a little bit more resilient and deal with setbacks. But everyone seems to be into the mental illness category when actually mm -hmm. there's quite a few who might be able to do something about them, themselves but they're not sure either how to or that they can yeah. sure, sure. wow it's interesting and, and talk yeah, me through well. i'm assuming based on what you said there you've got a lot going on and there's a lot of different strands to what you do so talk me through your, your kind of typical week yeah, so typical week, we, we run our group coaching on a, on an evening, which is great because obviously you're kind of working for yourself now, you get to, to work your own hours. Then sometimes there's workshops where we'll, now after COVID, you can start to do them in person. So yeah. that's been good, you know, getting back in, in doing that. Uh, also do mental health awareness talks. So obviously with some of the things we've just said, it's a slightly different take on it, which hopefully adds a little bit of value, which then rolls into the the one to 11 stuff which i'll which i'll come on to um and then the other thing i've kind of been doing as well a lot is writing at the minute i do a lot of kind of poetry and actually coming out of that process with mental my own mental health issues writing's been a massive uh, thing for me to get that down on on mm. paper so i'm looking to turn that into a bit of a book maybe that's going to be for poems for people to to kind of use so through the week it's mainly the coaching but we we particularly love the group coaching because it's you can have more impact on more people uh, yeah. in the same amount of, uh, of time. So it's all about this training program, which is this mentally match fit, which we're really looking to take forward now into different, you know, um, different areas, be that, you know, football. I'd love to take in a football because of the football theme. Yeah. Uh, we've been doing work yeah. with construction companies because the suicide rates and things are particularly high in, in, in construction. And then I'd love to as well take it, which hopefully we're going to start doing soon, is taking these ideas uh, into school so that we can start to work with kids at a younger age to get them thinking about this so that they can become, uh, I suppose, a little bit more resilient, have a few more tools in the locker to be able to deal with the things that life, you know, inevitably throws at us. That's amazing. Um, I mean... Obviously, you play football and you're doing what you're doing now, which is great. And there's an element of, well, there is obviously transition there. And there's loads of things that I'm assuming happened in between good, bad and different. So talk me through your kind of transition period. How was your 
retirement process and, and everything in and around that particular space? Yeah, so I retired in uh, 2007. I finished at Stockport at two, in 2005. Um, mm. And then I played non-league with um, Farsley Celtic for the last few years of my career, which was good. I think we got promoted all the way up to the conference. But 2007, just got to the end of that season, had a bit of a knee injury. You know, and the, the body was just saying, you know, you, you, need, <laughs> you, need, a, you need a rest now. And, and I think throughout my career as well, I'd, I'd, I'd come back, I'd had like three back injuries, I'd had a couple of operations, wow. dislocated shoulder, you know, I'd, I'd detach my retina in my eye on one, do you know, so it, it, it takes its toll, right, and I think yeah. psychologically, which we'll, we'll come on to as well, I think I was just at that place, so it wasn't a kind of, I didn't know I was going to retire at the end of that season, it mm. just came where I just went, you know what, physically I'm, 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 I'm shot, and I, I was all right, but uh, then I suppose it's like, what do you, what do you do, right, and so, I mean, fortunately enough for me, it, I kind of always wanted to help people. So I ended up um, working as a learning mentor for disadvantaged children for okay. six years. So that was a, a real eye opener in terms of what a lot of these children go through in the home life and that transition into school. And then often my role would be to help them transition from the unit where we work with them then into back into mainstream. But essentially, you know, I just say I swapped one arena where you get kicked and verbally abused for another one I just got paid a lot less a lot less dough <laughs> so, like, um, so but six years into that I think as well on top of the what comes off the back of being a uh, pro athlete the pressure in that and the emotional kind of stress with working in that job it just took its toll and and, and 2013 I um I went home with man flu one day from working in July uh 2013 I, I, I come down with the flu yeah uh, I was due yeah. to come back to work um there'd been a bit of a power struggle as well in the job I was in between two people, which I was in the middle of. Mm. And I think that just was the, when I thought I had to go back, that was just the straw that broke the camel's back. I was watching something with my daughter who was about five at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, just, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden this emotion came up and this tear just rolled down my face. I was like, this is, this is not the usual man flu, is it? Right. So uh, I knew at that point, something was uh, not as I'd like it to be. And I just felt completely flat. Danny, like, you know, when you just feel like you've got, you know, you're doing reps at the gym, you can't lift yeah. any more bench. Yeah. Yeah. I just felt completely like just, yeah, I was, I didn't just have any energy, energy left. And, and so, you know, I went to see the doctor, but I was worried about that. What if he said, there's nothing wrong with you? Yeah. You know, the usual yeah. old school football mentality. It's hard enough to admit that you're feeling like that anyway. To then yeah, go admit yeah. to a stranger, you're like, oh God, what if he says you've got to go back to work? there's nothing wrong with you, like I can't go back. So then, you know, you get yourself all worked up, but he didn't obviously, and, and, and I got a sick note and I, I got on some medication. Um, and then <clears throat> I just spent the next few months, it was like feelings of depression and anxiety simultaneously, which just obviously causes you quite a lot of distress and for the for the people are, are kind of around you. And that all came to a head uh, on the way to a counselling session where <clears throat> I nearly got knocked down. And actually the thought process in my head was, well, that was close. I could have got run over. Then I went, oh, might have broke my leg, my pelvis, maybe had a concussion. Mm. And then I said, oh, I might have even died. And then the next bit was, the next sentence out in my mind was like, that'll be all right, because all this will be over. Like that's, and I was like, right this is this i need to i need some some help so i got some help from the pfa which was brilliant you know yeah. um but even that getting ready to speak to someone from the pfa was like what are they gonna think yeah who's yeah. it gonna be fortunately it was someone that i knew who had been an ex-teammate so that was a massive relief right. and it just right. it just helped to kind of <clears throat> get through that process but the thing what i'd say is for people is you don't know it's going to happen. Like you, you, looking back now, but the signs are there. But you, if you don't know what to look for, how, how yeah. do you yeah. do? You know. So when I look back now, it was always coming from that in that six year period. Okay. Because I'd done yeah. other things to distract myself. I'd got into a relationship, new job. I'd become a dad, moved house. I'd done all these things, but yeah. that void was still still there, right? So sure. it, it, re it reached that kind of reached the head in in two thousand and thirteen. Wow. Thanks for sharing. I mean, that's a real roller coaster. And, and this is why I like to have kind of varied types of people on because 
yeah. you never know people's story. Uh, I don't know you. I've seen you on LinkedIn. No, you know no. Yeah. More about you. You, like, you put poems on there. They are really good as well. So that would be a good idea to have a book from that yeah, perspective. Cheers. That, that's all I know about you. And obviously I looked on Wikipedia and there's, there's not much on there about you, which it doesn't make a difference to me because yeah. your story is, this is why we're here for you to obviously let people know yeah. how you kind of cope with your tran transition and things like that. And um, a lot of people from the outside looking in, they've got perceptions of, of athletes, especially footballers, especially yeah. the high profile ones. And then everyone else beneath that gets tarnished with the same brush. Um, whether it be about kind of money they earn or, or whatever it is, lifestyle. We're not yeah, all the yeah. same. We're obviously human beings. We've all got different kind of um, levels of understanding and, yeah. and needs and wants and personalities and everything else that comes along with that. Um, so this is why I like to hear stories like this because this is obviously your transition. There's no, I always say, regardless of what anyone says, there's no right or wrong when it comes to how you approach your transition. So in a nutshell, the ideal world is to play football or whatever your sport is, and then have a vocation or something to run parallel to that. So when you finish, you can then roll into that. But we all know that not everyone's going to have that scenario. Not everyone's got that train of thought. Sometimes it's about timing and, and whatever. And also, you may even have a plan B, but sometimes plan Bs don't work. Circumstances can change. It could be a death in the family. And before you know it, you were on the straight and narrow, and now you've turned left a little bit. So there's all different things that can kind of uh, play into how your transition process works yeah. out. Um, so from, from anyone who's not connected to sport in any way, to hear stories like this, it, it must kind of, I wouldn't say alarm them, but it must allow them to see things from a different perspective. So, yeah, thanks for sharing. Yeah. You, no, no, along that no. way, you mentioned you got help from the PFA, but did you get any yeah. other type of help from anywhere else, like family or ex-teammates? Yeah. Well, yeah, so this is the this is the thing. I think you, you come out and family around you, but again, you don't understand this part of coming out of the game and the transition, so they're not kind of going to. It, mm. That's how it, it was for me. It's not that people didn't care or I didn't have people. I just mm. didn't know how to articulate how I was oh. feeling. And yeah. also, you know, with that link to sport, you're not going to admit that you've got a, a weakness because it just, when you was playing, it meant you wouldn't, be playing if you admitted yeah. those things, right? So what I try to say as well now when I speak in front of audiences and to people is that, if you, and it's not to get sympathy for sports people or, you know, the yeah. footballers, yeah. but what I say is if you can imagine that once you become pro or whatever, you're now in constant competition, aren't you? You're in competition to get in the team. Once mm. you get in the team, you're in competition to stay in the team. Yeah. Then you're playing, you're in competition with 11 other people <laughs> who are as good as you at your job, trying to stop you doing your job. Yeah. While you try to do this job and people try to stop you, you've got thousands of people who yeah. come in who think they can do your job, yeah. who've paid for the right to say what they want to you yeah. and expect yeah. you to do this job to a certain level. And then when you've done your job at the end of the day, I mean, it's different now, it's much quicker in terms of access to social media. But when I played, then someone who's never done your job to your level gives you a rating out of 10 yeah. for the whole country to see if you had a good day at work, right? Yeah. So, and, and what I say to people, could you imagine doing your job, sat at your desk and someone, thousands of people coming, calling your names and trying to put, put you off, right? So, but you don't think about that while you're doing it. But if you think about that over then a decade or more, mm -hmm. there's been a lot of kind of, you know, pressure. And the other thing I say as well, and this, this equates with lots of other industries, mm. you've got the client at the top who's demanded. So in football, it's the fans are the client. Mm. Then you've got the owners and the, the directors and the board. Then you've got the management staff and, and everybody. And then you've got the players. Now, where does that pressure go after that? Mm. It comes down this spike and the players don't have anywhere for that to go because they've got to do the do. Now, this then, to me, explains why lots of players get into the vices and things that they do to cope with that pressure mm. off the pitch, which then they get criticised for for doing, you know? And it's like, so there's a bigger, there's a bigger picture to look at when it comes to how people are behaving because the behaviours for me are, they're a cry for help or attention that this player needs a little bit of help, whether it's gambling, drugs, yeah. alcohol, yeah. you know, whatever they're into. It's, it's to me, understanding how I understand it now, this, where did they displace that, that pressure? So mm -hmm. if we had the system where people understood that, and again, not to be sympathetic, because players do make a lot of money and it's a, it's a good career, but just an understanding of 
where that's coming from and how can we yeah. adjust yeah. that through understanding talking we might create a different scenario and so then when we talk about the transition mm. you've had all yeah. that then you come into the uncertain part of your life where you're now not doing that thing that you are attached to that all your identity is wrapped up in yeah. because yeah. for me what once you, what who are you when you stop doing the thing that you that you used to do mm. you don't know mm. who you are you don't know if you've got any skills you, you you don't know if you've got any value so then that's the fallout from retiring then you've got to like say find a new career that you might not be skilled in or be confident in mm. while trying to deal with this changing kind of, of yeah. life and so yeah. you don't even understand that as a player so for your family and stuff that's going to be a difficult process then because if you're sad and moping around they're going to think well what have you, what are you so sad yeah. about? You know, yeah. actually, someone actually said that to me one time when I, not in my family, just someone who I knew, mm. when I said mm. I'd not been feeling too good. And they were like, well, what, what have you got to feel sad about? And it's like, it's crazy. Wow. Do you know, so then, it, then you feel even worse and more guilt for feeling terrible. And then it yeah. just yeah. spirals out of control, you know? Yeah. So I think from a transition point of view, hopefully for football and other industries, there might be some recognition of, why this happens and then hopefully if we can deal with it at source with, through education and saying to young players listen this is what's going to happen through your career mm, this is mm. what might happen at the end of it give them that decade or so or even less to prepare mm, we might have half mm. a chance of hopefully having less less players you know being in the situations that kind of yeah, i was in you know yeah. and i think of like the, the the kids who were at academies and then that dream's gone very quickly right that's a it's a bit of pill to to swallow yeah 100 percent. Uh, and obviously we hear the stories almost on a monthly basis where there's an academy player at whatever kind of level who's been released and then things are kind of spiral downwards from that point uh it's always very sad to hear those stories and i always kind of think well again this isn't me downplaying those scenarios but who's around that player from a club's perspective family perspective friends What's the player's mentality? As in, just because one club releases you doesn't mean you're not good enough for another club. There's a whole heap of different things. So it's just, it's tough. And we all know everyone's different. Your story's completely different to mine. Mine's like literally my transition, I've said this many times, was pretty seamless. I didn't really experience the things that you, you mentioned. And I was lucky and I didn't have a plan B when I was playing. Uh, my plan B was just to, to play until I hopefully wanted to stop. And luckily enough, that was my choice. I stopped yeah, when I yeah. wanted to. So very lucky from that point of view. So from, from going on from there then, so what kind of transferable skills did you take from, say, football to what you're doing now? So I think, well, so what, what I do now came as a result of that experience. Mm. So when I hit rock bottom, once I had the realisation of why that was with some of the things what we've just kind of mentioned it gave me the platform to to go on a, this road to kind of recovery but uh, naively I thought oh now I know what it is or I thought I did I thought oh I'm going to be all right now but I'll be fine but yeah. that didn't quite yeah. happen and so I fell back a few times but it's only when I fell back after quite a few times that I thought to myself I've had enough of this like I, I need to figure out what I'm doing mm. in the recovery mm. period so that's what I did and, and I I wrote down what I was doing in the recovery periods. And then when I looked on the piece of paper, there were 11 things, right? So obviously football, yeah. the team sheet. I, we, I used to play before squad numbers when gaffers used to say, if you win your battles one to 11, you win the game. So all that came into my head and I had these 11, this team sheet with yeah. these things. I did, and I thought, this is, I'm onto something here. Like it just all happened real quick. So I've started to, developed that then over the last nine kind of nine years and it's took on different kind of iterations and it's grown and developed mm. but what happened for me was then then i, I be, you know trained to be in nlp and then i did some eft mm. uh, and then i'd done some cbt as, as well in terms of practitioner kind of levels mm. but it was when somebody was doing a, a mental health initiative at a construction company and they asked if anyone would speak and, and a, a lady who I knew put my name forward. Mm -hmm. So I went to speak in front of an audience, but actually what happened was before I went on to speak, I had those same feelings of what it was like stood in the tunnel. Right? So, <laughs> you 
no, so like, you know what I mean? So it was yeah. really familiar. So I was all right. Like other people are like, oh, you're nervous. I was like, no, this feels great. Because mm. it was a throwback to that yeah, anticipation. Yeah. So yeah. I got on the stage and, and I did, you know, I told my story and, and I, I found out I enjoyed it. And I, I felt like I was I was good at it, right? And the feedback I got was, so in my mind, I was like, this is, not only have I found one thing that I used to love doing, which was football, I never thought I'd find something else that I love. And now, again, just stumble, I have. So then speaking to people and audiences and then developing this in a workshop, but working with people, I get a real buzz again. So it's kind of not a replacement for football, but I found another purpose and passion, which I didn't have when I finished. And so now this one to 11 uh, process and that we've t changed into a, a program for people is now what my passion is to take forward because I don't want people to feel the way that I felt back in 2013 when I was on the precipice. And if we can help people to not feel like that by giving them some tools and a bit of awareness of the steps you can take mm -hmm. to prevent that, then that's how I feel like what I should be doing now if that makes sense so oh, naturally oh. that's how it, it, it just as these you know similar maybe how you move forward you don't necessarily plan these things but those things are often the best best things that you end up you know doing yeah. i always say yeah. it's like um can't plan too much it's like the best nights out you've ever had right they were never <laughs> they were never planned were they? <laughs> there was always like they'll just go for a few at the local and then you yeah, ended out in yeah. town and you saw everybody, best tunes yeah, all, and yeah. it was like the best. And then the nights that were planned, like uh, New Year's Eve or something, they're always a letdown, right? So yeah, I say yeah. to people, you can you can make as many plans as you want, but just be aware that how attached you are to that plan and to that mm -hmm. goal, because actually the best things often come which are, are, are unscripted. Definitely. And I 100% resonate with the nights out. It's always the ones that are kind of <laughs> off the cuff, random phone call, and then, yeah. yeah, and then they become the best nights. Whereas the ones that are planned like weeks in advance, it's like you're looking forward to it and then it's a bit of a flop. Um, it was always the case. So yeah, 100% uh, kind of see where you're coming from there. In terms of retirement, especially I'd say our day, because we're pretty much the same era yeah. of playing uh, yeah. uh, kind of career time. Do you think retirement should be approached in a different way? And what I mean by that is, whenever when kind of I was playing, I don't know if it was like this for you, but I'm assuming it was. If ever someone approached retirement, whether it be, be asking you like, okay, well, what are your plans afterwards or whatever? It was always approached in a negative way or received in a negative way. Whereas if you maybe said, well, what are you going to do afterwards to help people? It would be seen as something more positive. So, and again, we hear these stories that have kind of been around since day one in yeah. regards to retirement transitioning and, and being released and whatever else. Yeah. So if we approached it in maybe a different way, do you think it would, would benefit us? And, and if so, kind of what do you think we should approach 100%. it like? 100%, yeah, because it's the conversation you never want to have, do you? Even when it, it's, it, flo it and it does get thrown out there from even when you're an apprentice, but yeah, yeah. that's not going to be me or you just don't want to think about Mm. It, you, like you'll avoid it at all costs essentially even though you know it's yeah. going to happen so but what you said interestingly I think and this is where in, this is what I believe with this program that I've de developed from this experience I believe if this was taught to young players mm. when they're first mm. coming through the academies and even less younger than this mm. that if you can learn these skills and these things in life that are ever present it's going to set you up for a, your career and give you that opportunity but also it's going to make you more aware of when that end of career comes and what it's going to be like for you potentially yeah. but also yeah. to help educate families and support networks two of what the athlete might be going mm. through mm. and I just think if we can give that to players at a younger age, I, you know, I wish, if I wish I'd have had someone, whoever had listened, there's the next thing, right? We might yeah. not listen, yeah. but it would be nice to have a program in place where you pick up these kind of, like, they are like life skills because, and it's different ways of thinking to yeah. prep you for yeah. that next stage. So for, for, for people to say to you like, listen, you know, your career is not going to last forever. We all know that, but like you said, can we give it a positive spin on, this emphasis on what you're going to do after because the biggest portion of your life hopefully is going to be after football where yeah. you're working right yeah. so what can we it's like it's like we're at school where kids have just got to do these subjects that they don't even like but if we could find a subject that they like or a vocation that they're into 
Mm. Imagine if they practiced that for like a decade before they got out of school. Yeah. They'd be so yeah. good at that, they'd just roll straight into it. So yeah. it's like doing that with the footballers and the players and the sports people. Is there anything else that you've got a bit of an interest in? Many of them might say no, because at that age, sometimes you don't. But yeah. is there yeah. anything else? Well, actually, there's this or there's that. And then couldn't we help guide them? Always with the understanding that this, this career is going to be one of the best things you'll ever do. Mm. Mm but it will come to an end. And talking to them about attachment and things like that, because mm. don't be so wrapped up in this persona of this, you're not what you do, that's not who you are. So mm. can, can we help them to detach a little bit from that, which then will enable them not to have as hard a fall when it comes yeah. to an end. Yeah. And so that's what I would, would love. Yeah, that imagine if like younger people got to practice this other thing that they liked. Mm. It'd be like an yeah. uh, uh, expert level by if they practice it for a for a decade, you know. Hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, many times I've mentioned before where, as athletes, you want first. It's always trust and stuff. We have people trying to sell us stuff all the time when when we're playing, uh, whether it be a service or an actual physical thing, jewelry or something. Yeah. So, if we can give them something more tangible, like you just said there, so work placements and things like that, things where they can go in and actively see people working and ask questions and get involved. And it allows them to see things from a different perspective. And also from an employer's perspective, it allows them to see an athlete from a different point of view as well. Yeah. Definitely. And then at least then, imagine if you're playing, let's say on a Wednesday when your day off is and you just go in and you could be working in a warehouse or you may be DJing or just doing something yeah. that you enjoy or something that you think you may have an interest in. At least then you can see it from, from there and see it for, for what it is. You can hear it, smell it, touch it. And then whilst you're playing, you're going to know that, okay, well, I've, I've done this maybe for six or seven months now. I feel quite comfortable. Then your results on the pitch will suddenly become more fruitful because you're not really thinking about what you have to do afterwards. So there's all of those things. I don't know why this hasn't happened yet. And I know I, I've got a yeah. feeling someone's going to hear what I've said, because I've said this many times, and they're going to yeah. take it and happy for them to do that. Uh, yeah, or if yeah. anyone even wants to hit me up on that, that would be fine as well. But um, yeah. Yeah. I, I just think if I was an athlete um, and that scenario was there for me to maybe choose a list of, out of 10, 15 things that I think yeah. vocational or, or whatever it is that I've potentially got an interest in, I would have done that. I would have done it. Would have done it. Uh, well, I think now as well with the technology and internet, there's never been a better time. The access that you can get to anything now is incredible, yeah. right? So what you just said there, I mean, even I think about they're already, actually during your career, you could already start to learn about marketing, right? Certainly mm. like without a use social media and some of them are already doing that. Yeah. But what a skill to have when you finish that might then take you into that next career or business yeah. studies because because the other thing is how many players or sports people come out are actually then employable if that makes sense in a yeah. in a regular you, mm. you're virtually unemployable if you've had a quite a long career because you're used yeah. to doing your, yeah. your your thing aren't you so off the back of that what could you have as a, a business maybe idea or whatever that you might have developed these skills like you said in your spare time because there is plenty of free time yeah. to then go and have this thing where you seamlessly roll you know roll into um but I, I don't know mate why it's not not happened yet and I still think that the the education is isn't there yet I, mm. I still think football aren't addressing the things what you're talking about now with this transition I think it's I don't I can't say 100% but I don't I think it's lacking. That's an area where we've got to look at real investment into helping yeah, yeah. athletes come through this process. And then they need people who can put something in place or have got that experience to help athletes to, to, to do this, right? Because, yeah, yeah, because yeah. you don't, as an athlete, you, you just don't, you've got no idea, have you, what it's like, whether you call it the real world or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. it's, you come out and you, you feel totally an alienated because I, I can only go from how I felt. You come into the real world, but you don't get the people you're working with because they've got a completely different mentality. They've maybe been at school and then worked all the, the life, yeah, you know? Yeah. Whereas if you've been a footballer or an athlete, you've had a totally different experience. So mm -hmm. when you come together, you don't get them, they don't get you, things you think. Are, and so that's where this, you know what I mean? Like you said then, maybe having a bit of work placement um, mm -hmm. experience and, and, and doing all these things. But of course... 
it still comes back to a willingness from people and an awareness to to do stuff. So. Because I always say, like, there's never been a better time to get educated. Yeah. But yeah. it's like people say it, don't they? Oh, more education, more education. But without a willingness and an awareness, no one goes and gets educated. You need yeah. to you need to bother, don't you? Because we could go learn whatever we wanted now. But exactly. we have to be aware that we want to do it, and we also have yeah. to be bothered to go and do yeah. it. You know? yeah. So I think that's the kind of thing. But I certainly think speaking to players as early as possible mm. to try to put this into their minds and drip feed it into this this importance of getting ready for that transition. Definitely. And I think in terms of delivery, I think it would be an easier sell if it comes from people like yourself who have played the game, people like myself. Because as you know, as a group of players, if you've got someone coming in and they're saying, oh, by the way, I think we should do X, Y and Z, in their head, they're, the, they're going to be thinking, well, who are you? Like, Have you actually played the game? It's like, it's like when you've had a manager who's probably, and again, there's loads of managers who've never played that have been really successful. But when you've got a manager who may have not played at a certain level that you potentially had, and then they're coming in and saying, oh, by the way, you've learned how to play passing football, and now I'm going to tell you how to play long ball. It's like, well, I'm not used to playing long ball. And then there's like that um, kind of resistance there straight away. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It just seems like there's a lot, people are a lot more aware of it now yeah. from the outside and also from within the game. Yeah. But it's, it's as if to say, well, we're aware it's there. Let's just leave it until we really have to get involved. That's the feeling I get anyway. Uh, and I know there are a lot of clubs out there who do do a lot of stuff. Yeah. But, and it's easy to blame the clubs. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. They all clubs need to do more, but yeah. I think everyone needs to. You mentioned earlier family, friends, the athlete yeah. themselves, because ultimately it's the athlete yeah. that has to say, yep, yeah, I want to go and do that. It doesn't matter what's put in front of them. It doesn't matter about stats and all that. You can yeah. come up with all the stats in the world. But if, if they're not willing to make that first initial step, it's never yeah. going to work. Yeah, definitely. Well, like you said, I think definitely for players to uh, like speak to players like yourself or, or me, if that's what they choose, where you can lend those experiences of what that transition has been like. And, you know, and I certainly think for my, with what's happened with my story, I think that would be beneficial for a lot of the, the, the players because it's like you said, it's not a, I'm not making this up. This is like this happened and it, you're coming from where they come from. So mm. there's that connection to go, boom, that could happen to me. You don't, the neck might have to take on board what he's, what he's saying, you know? Um, but yeah, I think like you said, for me, it's, it is about the first kind of step in the one to 11 is acceptance and responsibility. And you mentioned that mm. everybody mm. needs to, take that responsibility from clubs to the players to you know the staff you know even even fans as well like everybody you know everybody yeah. needs to start looking at them we've got to look at ourselves first before then you can go and help other people right and I said until you do that I don't think um, it, it can work but like you said I, I think there's a there's a token gesture yeah, but we're we're not quite at that point where we go. We better do something yet, and that that happens a lot, doesn't it? People and organisations only deal with stuff often when it goes really wrong. Mm. Never mm. look at stuff when it's just going all right or even going well. So, mm. yeah, it'd be great. I, you know, I just I just think there's a lot of people out there who've got a lot to a lot to offer, but are maybe yeah. not being yeah. given the opportunity to. So even have that conversation with 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 sports clubs or organisations to see what what can be done, you know. Hundred percent. Going forward, then, have you got any advice that you'd give to any any players out there? And I'm talking youngsters who may have just literally yeah. just started kicking a ball. To anyone who's literally approaching retirement and yeah. kind of in in the near future, I, I would say definitely think about you are not your football's what you do. It's not who you are. That, that's a, a because it's so easy when you've done it your whole life to believe I'm a footballer. This is and all your identity and all your value is wrapped up in that that thing. Yeah. And I always yeah. say, what happens when you're not do? Because if you you have to be nothing without football to be all right as well. Do you know? So it's like yeah. Yeah. love what you do, but understand it, it. It's not who you are. So be a little bit detached. Have a bit of detachment from it. Therefore, mm. then as well, you're not going to take it as personally when people, you know, maybe criticise or give you a little bit of grief. I think I say to people, communication's key. Like, 
being open and honest is the one of the things that saved kind of my my life in terms of if you don't communicate how you feel if so, so someone could end their career it's all right to say i'm scared i'm mm. confused i don't know what i'm going to do right i'm like I'm, I'm i have got no clue that's yeah. good because yeah. then you can get the help if mm. you don't say it people think you're all right and then yeah. they'll yeah. they'll see what happened with me was people was giving me um kind of ideas or saying advice why don't you do this why do you do but they didn't know where i was at so mm -hmm. i was getting angry with people then thinking you haven't got a clue if i do that it's gonna be but i realized i hadn't communicated with them so mm -hmm. i think communication both for the athlete families club th this whole communication thing has to be more open so so that just be honest about where you're where you're at right and i think that's important for the athlete but it's also important for the families and so that the athletes know the families are feeling and, 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 and vice versa. Um, and I would say to have a think about um, a goal, have a, have a goal, have a bit of purpose in your yeah, life, because yeah. if you don't, that's when you're likely to get side sidetracked and stuff. And so just try to have a little bit of an idea of what direction you might want to go in. Yeah. Um, yeah, and surround yourself with with good with the best people that you that you can, you know. Uh, and yeah. I, and I think yeah. it's just that. And then it comes back to just looking at you as a as a getting. To, do you know what? It's like getting to know yourself again. Because I think you play a character as a footballer, don't you? Like I said, it's it's not who you are. You, you go in a dressing room, you act a little bit differently around the lads because if you're a little bit more of a sensitive character, that's not really. Mm. <laughs> you're probably going to get eaten alive or you can't show that side of your character so yeah. you, yeah. you put on your armor don't you and you go out you get abused every week so you've got to be you've got to have broad shoulders so but mm. i think mm. what happens is the broad shoulders the armor you forget to take it off mm. when you when you've finished and then you're still walking around and <laughs> no, no one can get to you right and, and yeah. you don't recognize yeah. yourself yeah. and i think yeah. it's just that ability to just say this is this is what I do. It's not. It's not who I am. I always say it's a bit like Clark Kent and Superman, isn't it? It's like he always said, Superman. Clark is who I am. Superman's what I what I do. So your your job is what you do. It's not who you. Definitely, hundred percent. I uh, really enjoyed the chat. Appreciate your time uh, today. I mean, if you can once again, just let us know uh, what you do, the name of the company, where we can find yeah. you, and where we can find you on the socials. Yes, yeah, so I'm on all social media links. Uh, Martin Pemberton. Uh, I'm on uh, Instagram uh, at Pem One to Eleven. The company is just One to Eleven, and the program that we run is called Mentally Match Fit, um, and it's designed to give people the tools to increase their mental fitness. If we want to talk of it in kind of that way, if it's an injury that you've got, just like physically, you'd rehab an injury, you'd do that mentally as well. And if you're ill, then it's a, can we, how can we transition or at least manage that illness to the best of our ability? Uh, and we, we're looking to take this to as many places and, and people as possible. And it, it's not for people, it does not just for people who are really, really struggling. This is for kind of anyone because we all have got challenges, aren't we? And it's like just giving people the, the tools, the ability to just have a choice because there's lots of people who don't feel they've, they've, they've got a choice, you know? And so yeah. that's what we want to do going forward, you know, take this to as many people as possible to try and educate and, and inspire and, and help to uh, change the way. What we always say is like, change what you think, you know, to change how you think, to change how you feel, mm. to change what you do. And it's, uh, that's, the, that's the goal. Awesome. Amazing stuff. Um, hope it goes well. Um, sounds like you're doing great things. Once again, appreciate your time um, and obviously keep up the good work and keep in touch and we'll go from there. Will do, mate. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. No problem. See you soon. See you, mate. Bye-bye.